Chapter 50, that's where our lesson will come from tonight, Genesis chapter 50. <clears throat> we talked about Joseph briefly in the lesson this morning um, in regards to uh, the forgiveness that he had for his brothers and how really in the process of that he um, really tested them uh, through a series of events and questions and things that he kind of put them through. Uh, almost kind of bizarre at times how he did that. Uh, but he tested them and just made sure that they were sincere, uh, made sure that they were changed men and, and honest men. Uh, so we, we talked about that a little bit this morning, but I said tonight we would come back uh, to one particular verse, and that's verse 19. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment, but I encourage you to open the, with me there to Genesis 50. Uh, we'll start start um, in verse 14, and then we'll read through verse 21. We'll take our lesson from that. Genesis 50, beginning in verse 14, it says, After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers and all who went up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, <clears throat> they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive their trespasses of their servants of the God your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And then his brothers also went in and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God. But as for you, you meant an evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now therefore do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And that's exactly what Joseph did. God's people became God's people in the land of Egypt, largely in part because of what Joseph did. With that reading in mind, are you ever guilty or do you ever struggle with kind of sticking your nose or your foot in places that it's really not in your business to be doing so? Am I the only one that does that? No. No, okay. Guys, I got one person in here that sometimes maybe gets involved in something you shouldn't be. I think we all probably do that, right? Sometimes in life we just get mixed up in things, and maybe it's not in a personal way. It might be... Um, just in, a, in an emotional, uh, spiritual type of way, but it could be relationship-wise as well. Sometimes we, we take on more than we should. That's what I'm getting at. Sometimes we take on more than we should. Uh, we put more pressure on ourselves than we should. We carry burdens that we should not carry. And when we do that, we cause ourselves unnecessary stress and unnecessary struggles that, that we should have in, having to be facing that we're not designed to carry, that we're not designed to deal with, but yet, for whatever reason, we do that. We worry, we stress, uh, we try to work things out that, again, it's none of our business to be able to, to do so. But yet, for so whatever reason, sometimes we still carry that load. That was not Joseph. Joseph was a person who, who understood his place in this world. He understood what God expected him to do, and he understood what he was not supposed to do. And he didn't cross that boundary. Maybe at first in his life he didn't understand this, but obviously he has learned this lesson through what he's gone through. And there's a great lesson that we have to, to learn from Joseph tonight. When you kind of paint the scene of what's happening here, Jacob or Israel's body has just been put to death, or just been put to, to burial. He's not been dead that long, and I like to put it in this way. Um, his corpse is pretty much still warm. I mean, it, it's that fresh. As soon as, as, soon as, as everything's kind of settled with his burial, everything's still kind of fresh, it's not really settled in, immediately his brothers are scared for their life. Immediately, all the, the, the things that they did to their brother, and if our math is right, if my math is right, Joseph is somewhere around uh, 56 years old right here. So if we, if we go back to the time that he was 17 or so, something like that, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of about, about 39 years ago, previous to this, is when his brothers left him in the pit for dead and then sold him to the Midianite traders. His father has just been put in the grave, and then all of that comes flooding back with his brothers. They send messengers, they go in themselves, 
And they're begging and they're pleading with their brother. Please don't kill us. We know what you, we did to you. We know we faked your death. It's almost like they're recounting everything. But please give us some mercy and pardon. And notice how, how Joseph just breaks down and cries. As we talked about this morning, I believe Joseph had already put all that away. He had proven to himself through a series of tests that they were sincere. But he is really beside of himself here. And his statement really says a lot. And when you think about it, I, I'm, I'm just blown away by his peace here. His peace with the situation that his father's dead. His peace with his brothers. Um, his peace with the past. His peace with a lot of series of events in his life that has been really not very fortunate. But yet what he says in Genesis 15 and verse 19 says a lot about the wisdom that, Job, that, that Joseph acquires at this point in his life. He says, brothers, I, I'm not worried about what happened 39 years ago. I'm not holding that against you. There's no reason to fear. I know what you meant. You meant it for evil. You meant it for as evil as it could have been. But God meant it for good. And he said, furthermore than that, brothers, he says, am I in the place of God? I think the answer to that question is, as far as Joseph was concerned, no, I'm not. His question is really a statement. I'm not in God's place, so I'm not concerned about what all has happened. If you and I could realize that we're not in the place of God, and I think all of us would admit tonight that we're not, but if we would live as if we're not in the place of God, we would find that our lives would be a lot more peaceful, myself included. We would find that, that a lot of the things that we carry as a heavy weight in our lives, we don't have to carry. So as we think about that tonight, I want to think about Joseph. I want to think about his statement and think about four simple ways that we are not in the place of God. And kind of tied into what we're talking about here with Joseph. The first thing that really comes to mind is ultimately, um, really his statement says this as well. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The day that, that he was in the pit probably didn't seem much like what he said in Genesis chapter 50. He probably thought it was the end of the road. When he was sold into slavery, he probably thought that was the end of the road. And every bump along the way that he hit, in every valley that he went through, even when he was forgotten in prison, he probably thought, this is it. But if he had learned anything throughout the whole thing, even when he was in the pit at the bottom of life, if you will, God was still in control. Sometimes we don't realize that. But even when we're in the pit of life, even when in our darkest moments, God is in control. And that's what we learn, I believe, from his statement. He says, I'm not in God's place. I'm not the one moving the pieces. I'm not the one working all this out. God is. And the sooner we realize that in life, the sooner we quit trying to fix everything, the better off we'll be. We need to realize that God is in control and that His power and His influence is not limited. Ours is, and that's why we get so stressed out. We see all these problems, we see all these issues, and, and we've got to fix it. Or maybe I do. Maybe it's just me. But I think a lot of times we feel like, I've got to fix this. But we're not in control of that. God is. And I believe Joseph understood that. Again, maybe he didn't understand it when he was in the pit. Maybe he did. But I guarantee you, if he felt that God was in control, it was not as clear as it was from the pit as it was here in Genesis 50. Looking back over it all, seeing how it all worked out, definitely the hindsight was 2020 there. But Joseph had learned in his life that God's power and influence is not limited. We go back to Genesis chapter 18 and in verse 14 where both Abraham and Sarah laughed at the idea of having a child in their old age. And uh, Mike mentioned this, this just briefly this past week. But you remember what, what question was brought up to them there as they laughed? Not just did you laugh, but is anything too hard for the Lord? Again, a statement and a question. That God's Word has a beautiful way of doing that. But essentially by asking a question, what is stated there is that don't doubt God. Nothing is beyond His control. Nothing is beyond His ability. So don't doubt that. Don't question that. Because God can definitely do it. And that's exactly what Job said in Job chapter 42. Uh, in verses 1 through 2, when, when God pretty much just put him through the ringer, and, and, and Job's kind of sitting there questioning God, and then God listens, and God says, okay, I'm going to respond. And after a long lecture that he gave Job, Job, I, I'm almost kind of envisioning Job kind of, kind of hunkered down and hiding. And listen to what he says. He says, I know that you can do everything. 
and no purpose is withheld of yours. And furthermore than that, he kind of summarized, I kind of summarized what he said. He says, I, I, I won't question you anymore. <laughs> what Job said was exactly right. Any purpose that God has, His will, His workings, none of that can be withheld from Him. We started talking about in class this morning in the back with the young folks about how we got the Bible and how it's been preserved down through the times. And, and we hadn't even really got into all the attempts yet that people have, have, have given to try to eliminate it. But it's, it's still here. It's still here because God's plan can't be thwarted. No matter the amount of evil, God is in control. But sometimes we forget that. I don't believe Joseph did. I do believe Moses did. As good of a leader as Moses was, as many things that he, as he had seen and witnessed and, and up to this point had, had even carried out in his life, he forgot in Numbers chapter 20 one important thing. And that was that he and his brother were not God. A lot of times we'll say, well, well you ask the question, why didn't, why didn't Moses get to go to the, to the promised land? Well, he hit the rock when he's supposed to speak to it. Well, that wasn't really it. You may say, well, yeah, that's after that is when, when it got brought out that he wouldn't get to go into the land of Canaan. Well, that's what happened. But really, there, there's, there's an underlying issue that I really believe upset God the most. It wasn't just a sheer disobedience. It was that statement right there that says, here now, you rebels, must we bring you water from this rock? Let me tell you something. Moses couldn't bring water from any rock. Just as much as Moses couldn't part that water that they had already walked through. He didn't have that ability. Only God did. And when he forgot just for a moment that it was not we in control, or that it was not God in control, but we, when he started thinking we bring water, well, that's, that's where God couldn't, couldn't let that one go. You ever thought about that? I firmly believe it because that was not the only mistake that, that Moses ever made, but that one seemed to upset God the most. You see, we've got to remember who's in control. And when we start acting like we're in control, well... That'll keep you out of the promised land. We cannot elevate ourselves to God's level, whether we do it out of good intent or not, because God is in control. And Peter understood that. Sometimes Peter got a little bit weak and he kind of faltered. But when the Jews in Acts chapter 11, when the Jews questioned the fact of this whole deal that in Acts chapter 10 about Cornelius' household and going to the Gentiles and, and that the gospel had been extended to them and that the Spirit had fell on them and that they had been baptized and all these different things, he's recounting all this to them and, and, and he can see their, their frustration. He can see their questioning. He can see their judgmentalness. And we're going to talk about that in a moment as well. And Peter said, look, he said, I witnessed all these things. I saw all these things. I'm telling you the truth. And furthermore than that, who was I that I could withstand God and say, God, we don't need to go to these Gentiles. See what Peter's saying? Peter's saying that God is in control. And if God says the Gentiles can now be saved through Christ, then I ain't going to stand in his way. Sometimes I'm afraid, whether we realize it or not, we stand in God's way. Maybe because we don't have enough faith, maybe because we think our ideas are better. But God is in control. And when Joseph said, am I in the place of God, he is admitting, admitting very openly that God has been in control of this whole thing. And he's still in control now. So brothers, don't be afraid. You don't have to worry about me. I'm not going to do anything about it. It takes a lot to say that. It takes a lot of faith. But what peace it allowed him to have in his life. Secondly, I also believe that he is suggesting that God is the judge. We, we, we mentioned this this morning in the forgiveness issue because one reason that Joseph was able to forgive his brothers is because he didn't hold that sin clearly and prevalent before his eyes. He, he, he let it go. He passed it on and he had forgiven them of that. Now obviously it helped when they proved that they were more sincere as, as opposed to what they were before. But I, I firmly believe that Joseph had turned their sin over to God. But I want you to think about the position he's in here. When Joseph was in the pit, he was in no place to judge his brothers. When, I would even say when he was in Potiphar's house, he was in no position to, to judge his brothers. But he is second in command in Egypt right now. He has full authority to do whatever he wants to do. And nobody raises a finger and questions him, not one bit. He could have gotten even, and he could have gotten more than even with his brothers. And Pharaoh would have said nothing. Probably would have even have said, good job, Joseph. Thank you for getting rid of these heathens. They might come in here and cause us problems. 
It would have been very easy from a humanistic standpoint to be sitting in high command and be trying to figure out, well, well, well what, what, does, what do these guys deserve? It would have been easy to sit there and to dwell on the fact of, of how much they deserve to be punished and how wrong he was in his life, how, how mistreated he has been in his life. But that wasn't Joseph's concern. In fact, he didn't even care about it. Wasn't even concerned about it. Wasn't even on his mind. At least in the context of what we read. In fact, it upset him to even think that his brothers would think that he's concerned about that. The whole thing upset him that, that they even came to him and, and begged him to not hurt him because that was not in his plans whatsoever. So I think we understand from that that just as Joseph pushes away from that, so should we. We are, we are not the judge. And I'll tell you why. Psalm chapter 139, verses 2 through 4. Notice what the psalmist says. The psalmist says, You know my sitting down, my rising up. You understand my thoughts are far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. There is not a word on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, that you know it all together. He's saying there about God that you know everything I think, everything I say, my path, my understanding, everything. He says, You know it all. As much as Joseph knew, as much wisdom as he had, he did not fully know everything, and neither do you or I. We don't. We don't see, as mere mortals, we don't have the capacity to see and to understand and to comprehend as God does. The psalmist clearly says that. And, and even in regards to how David was chosen, and when all of his brothers were not, when all the sons uh, of his father passed through, not one of them was chosen, and Samuel was like, just kind of at a loss. Just kind of at a loss as, as to what's going on. So is, so is Jesse and everybody else involved, and he says what? Well, can you not see that maybe I choose in a different way than you choose? You've picked the finest, you've picked the tallest, you've picked the most handsome, you've picked the, the, the most uh, appearance-wise, strongest that, that would look to be a good leader. He says, but you've not looked at what I can see and only I can see, and that is the heart. That's why you need to bring David that you forgot about out in the field. You need to bring him in here because I'm looking at his heart and I know what his heart says. I know what his heart is because I created his heart and I know what he's doing with it now. Again, you and I don't have that capacity. We need to leave the judging up to God. He'll work it out. Uh, he'll, he'll deal with it in the way that it needs to be dealt with. And furthermore than that, I, I, sometimes I think about it, I don't know why we would ever want to be the judge. Sometimes we do that by the way we act and the things we say about people. But as, it is, as much as it's on my plate, and I'm sure it's on yours, and all the responsibilities that we have, why would we want to add being a judge to it? <laughs> now, I know we have to have judges that, that are over the laws of our land and do different things in, in, our, in our legal and in our court system. But when it comes to spiritual things, why, why would we want to live in such a way? Why would we want to act and think in such a way when we don't even have all the credentials that it takes to, to do that? David was, or, or Joseph rather, was, was in the position to, to do something about that. In fact, he very well could have been their judge. But that was not what he was concerned about. He was not concerned about what had happened. He was really not so much concerned about what was going on right then as he was taking care of them both now and most importantly in the future. You and I need to strive to be more like that. So often we get hung up on, on things that people have done and, and that's, that's what we want to talk about and that's what we want to dwell on and that's what we want to kind of label them as. But that needs to be left up to God. Now there is a time where we have to kind of size somebody up to know how to deal with them. But there's a difference in kind of classifying somebody than in judging them and saying whether they're worthy or they're unworthy. Joseph said, am I in the place of God? Of course. He was not, and neither are we. But I'll tell you something else that goes along with that one, because when we, when we let ourselves go too far with, with judging others, whether it's verbally or just mentally, vengeance comes into play. And if it's not physical vengeance, if we're not really doing something, we're, we're really thinking about it, and then we're thinking about what we'd like to do. I'm going to tell you what, that'll ruin a person. That will ruin you, and that will ruin me. I want you to think about the, the, the 39 years, if, if we're right there, between the age of 17 and give or take 56 years or so that Joseph is of his age right here. Of all the things that Joseph has accomplished, what if he had spent that whole time 
sitting in the pit, sitting in Potiphar's house, in prison, in Pharaoh's house. What if, what if he had spent all of that time thinking about a plan of if he ever sees his brothers, how he's going to get even? Let me ask you this. During the time of the good years when he's putting back all the produce, when everything else is burned up, when everything else is burned up at the end of that time and, and he's sitting there and he's trying, trying to put back good things when, when there is good things to put back, what if he'd not been putting back and he'd been thinking about his brothers and what they had done? You ever thought about that? I dare say there would have been no food to eat in Egypt. There would have been no salvation for his brothers. Might not even have had a God's people that came up in the, way of, in the way of Egypt like they did. Now, would God have made another way? Sure. But all of that came because of Joseph, because he didn't dwell on vengeance. What I'm saying is, is that thinking about how you're going to get even, thinking about how you're going to even the score, letting that eat at you and think about what you'd like to do because of what somebody has done or said to you will ruin you. And that's a miserable life to live. I believe Joseph realized that he was not in the place of God when it came to vengeance. Did his brothers deserve whatever he could think up possibly to do to them? I'm sure they did. But he was not worried about that. He was not concerned about that. And neither should you and I be. I always think about King Saul when I think about vengeance. When I think about an ill will, when I think about hatred that, that kind of dwells in our heart. When David came back from battle, when he, had, when he had killed Goliath, and all the word is spread around about it, what, what was said? The women sang a song, and that really ticked Saul off, didn't it? What did they say? They said, Saul has done what? Saul has described his thousands and killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. We've got somebody better than Saul here, folks. Look at this young boy that came out of the field with all those sheep. He has killed his thousands and ten thousands. And from that day on, it says there in verse 9 of 1 Samuel chapter 18, after David, or after Saul kind of restated what everybody was saying, it said from that point on, he eyed David. That was when Saul's life changed and it never got better after that. You ever thought about that? Saul had a pretty decent life, had a pretty decent kingship up to that point. But when his heart was consumed with vengeance, when his heart was consumed with getting even and pretty much killing David because he was jealous of him, his whole life was ruined. Now, did David deserve to be judged? No, David had done good things. But, but the point is, he put himself in a position he shouldn't have been in because he wanted to even the score. He, or at least he thought he needed to. Not that David had done anything wrong, but, but the principle is still the same. <laughs> If we're always thinking about how we can even the score, we'll live in misery and we'll live in suffering because, well, that's not what we're designed to do. Why did God say it both in the old law and in the new law? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I'll tell you why. Because if somebody does need to be straightened out, and if somebody does need to be punished, the one to do it is God. You and I can't really do that. And I would even venture to, to, for you to consider this. If, if somebody has really wronged us or, or, or we feel like we've been mistreated or whatever, what can we really do about it to fix our problem? If you've been mistreated, you've been mistreated. I mean, it can't be undone. You might say, well, I can get back something that was taken or this or that. And, and maybe you've got a point. But the point is, is that you, you've still been mistreated or you've still been done wrong and there's emotional scars from that. So you really can't fix it. We just have some kind of twisted mentality sometimes that says, well, if I do something to them, that kind of evens it out, but I'm still hurting too. You see, we can't really fix that. In fact, we probably only make it worse by doing whatever we think we need to do. But God, however, God, again, has the credentials and has the ability to really even the score. And I would say much more than even the score, the humble will be exalted. And those who are haughty and prideful, well, God will deal with them in His time. We need to remember that. Joseph could have lived the entirety of his life with vengeance on his mind, but he didn't. And because he didn't, he was a better servant because of it. And finally, like we've already stated, sin can only be removed by God. Sin carries with it a weight and carries with it a price that you and I can't pay. 
That goes for trying to carry the weight of my sin, and that goes for trying to carry the weight of your sin, or you carrying the weight of anybody else's. Joseph said to his brothers, Look, I, I know you messed up, and I know you did some awful things, but ultimately that's between you and God. I've forgiven you, but the rest of it's between you and God. He said, I can't, I can't pay that for you. You can't pay that for me. Sin has to be turned over to God. You and I can't fix it. We can work through it together to improve things, but sin has to be turned over to God. That's exactly what, what Paul said in Romans chapter 7. Paul says, the things that I will to do, those things I do not do, and the things that I will not to do, those things are what I do. He says, I know what I'm supposed to do, and I turn around and do right the opposite of it. And I know I'm doing it while I'm doing it. I just, I just it's almost like I can't stop. <laughs> That is a man who is admitting that he has a problem. And his problem is sin. And he asks the question, Who will deliver me from this body of death, O wretched man that I am? And then he gives the answer. It's through Jesus Christ our Lord that all this mess that I'm dealing with can be fixed. I hope we understand that. Joseph could have looked back over his life and seen a huge mess and he thought, how can I ever repair all these damages that my, my awful brothers have done to this family? But he didn't do that. And rather than that, he looked at it and said, am I in the place of God? God God's going to work this out. And God's going to fix all of it in His time. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 through 14 teaches us an important lesson that without God, we're, we're lost in, in the world and doesn't have hope, but... One thing brings us near, and that's the blood of Christ. Sin, whether it's personal or those of other people, cannot be fixed ourselves. If it's my sin, I've got to quit carrying the weight of it. If it's the sin of others that I'm struggling with, then I need to carry that to God as well. Either way, whether it's personal or that of others, we've got to carry that sin to God and let Him deal with it. And I, I firmly believe that's what Joseph has done. They stated their sin... David or, or Joseph didn't even talk about the sin. He said, am I in the place of God? That's between you and God. So is my sin. So is yours. Turn that sin over to God. Because He's the only one that can do anything about it. So to kind of rehash what we said tonight, and I'll, I'll close the lesson with this. We are not in control, number one. The sooner we realize that, the better off we'll be. We are not the judge, so we need to quit acting like it. We need to quit thinking like it. We're not responsible for evening the score if there's anything that needs to be worked out. We need to let God do that. And as far as my sin or anybody else's sin, well, that has to be turned over to God. In all four of those cases, we are not in God's place. Let God do what God does and let us understand what we need to do. When Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says that God is working all things together for the good, for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, that means that He is in His place working things the way that it needs to be worked. Let's stay out of His way. If anything in Joseph's life he did right, it was this. He stayed out of God's way and he allowed God to use him in the way that God needed to use him. And the sooner we do that, the better off that we'll be. But I want to end with this. <coughs> Excuse me. Why was Joseph filled with so much peace? After all, Joseph was human. He had been wronged. He could have been, he could have been killed. He could, have, he could have lost his life at any given point across there. Think about this. I hadn't really pointed this out. He lost 39 years of his life, give or take, with his family. He hadn't got to see his father. He hadn't got to see his mother. He hadn't got to see his brother Benjamin. He hadn't got to see so many people that he loved. He's lived in a foreign place. He's lost half his life. How did he have so much peace about that? How was, how was he so much okay with that? I'll tell you why. I think it's very simple. It's because he let go of all the things that we so often worry about. And he let God handle it. The sooner we do that, the more at peace we'll be. And whatever it is that we're struggling with, the sooner that we realize that we are not in the place of God. We let God stay where He needs to be and we get out of His way and follow His lead. We'll be a lot happier and a lot more peaceful in our lives. We learned that from Joseph. And hope tonight we, we understand that lesson. 
Tonight it may be that you're going through some things in your life that, that you've, you've been struggling with for a while and maybe you've been trying to carry that load and try to work through it and try to figure all that out on your own. Uh, the, the message to you tonight is very simple. You need to stop that. <laughs> and so do I. And we need to realize that God is there to help us. And we need to let Him do His thing, which is fix you and me. If we can help you in any way tonight, we'd be happy to do so. Whether it's to pray for you or with you or whether you need to become a Christian. If we can help you in any way, won't you come while we stand here, while we sing. <clears throat>